Dwayne uh, Miller's greatest enjoyment was preaching to his small congregation and singing songs of worship like we've just been doing. Not only was this his great joy, but uh, this was his passion and his source of, uh, of income uh, to his church in Brenham, Texas. One Sunday morning, he woke up uh, with the flu and his voice was gone. Well, he got over the flu, but his voice never came back. He had only a raspy whisper. And so he resigned from his church, couldn't preach anymore. Uh, he found uh, another job with the government uh, researching records, uh, but he soon lost that job as well because he couldn't report in court his findings. At that point, he was demoralized. He didn't have a job. He didn't have income. Uh, insurance uh, bills were piling up. Insurance stopped paying his expenses, and he didn't know what to do. Uh, over a period of uh, uh, three years, he saw 63 doctors. Uh, he was uh, seen by a symposium of uh, uh, doctors, a Swiss symposium of some of the finest uh, throat uh, specialists in the world. He asked, what's my prognosis uh, for recovery? And they said, zero. Against his protestations, a, his uh, home uh, church, a First Baptist in Houston, a uh, Sunday school class there invited him to speak. They loved him. They loved his teaching. So they set up a microphone to, uh, where he could speak and amplify his voice. And he was speaking from uh, Psalm 103 uh, that uh, uh, he, God heals all your diseases. As he was uh, speaking about that, he thought, yeah, you know, I believe that, but why doesn't God heal me? And, uh, and then the, the next line says, uh, he delivers you from the pits of destruction. He's saying, you know, you've had pit experience, I've had pit experience, and, uh, uh, and as he said the word pit, he spoke it clearly. And there were gasps in the, in the class, and they realized his voice was back, and so they began to clap and cheer and laugh, and his wife, Jolene, broke down in tears. Uh, one of the persons in the class uh, uh, captured this whole thing uh, on their cell phone video, and it went viral. The doctor said, I don't, I don't know how to explain what happened to you. Uh, I, can't, I can't explain how your voice came back, and it's even harder uh, to, to explain why you don't have any scar tissue. The pictures before and after, it's completely gone. Uh, he's now the pastor of uh, Pinnacle Church in the uh, Cedar Creek Lake uh, uh, area of Texas, uh, and he has a, uh, uh, a radio program in Dallas where he talks about the supernatural power of God that's available today. So what do you think of a story like that? Do you think this is just kind of an uh, unexplainable medical phenomenon or a supernatural miracle from God? I believe it's a miracle. I mean, he's alive. He's a pastor of a church. Uh, the doctors have medical records to show his before and after. God is still in the miracle business. How can we experience more of God's supernatural power in our lives? Let me this morning suggest four ways. First, open our eyes to the possibility of God doing supernatural miracles today. Craig Keener is probably the leading authority on miracles. Uh, his book on miracles is kind of considered the gold standard. Uh, and when he married his wife, uh, she told him that her older sister had been uh, resuscitated, that she'd literally been dead and been raised again. And uh, in researching his book, he decided he would go there uh, to check it out for himself. This was in uh, Africa, in the Congo, Brazzaville area. And so he interviewed all the people who were around. Turns out that her older sister was, named Teresa, was two years old. Uh, her mom left her in the, her little, I don't know, house, hut, and went next door and, uh, to give some food to the neighbors. When she came back, Teresa was crying. 
She'd been bitten by a snake. So she picked her up quickly, put her in her uh, like backpack and, and rushed out. They, they had no doctors, no medical facilities around there. So she ran to her friend, which was up a mountain and down the other side. While she was running, uh, Teresa stopped breathing. By the time she got to her friend, uh, she at least had support of her friend, but there was no doctor there either. Uh, what could they do? They, they figured that she uh, had been, not been breathing for three hours. And uh, if a person goes without oxygen for six minutes, they can have damage. So they cried out to God, God, please bring her back. And immediately, Teresa began to breathe again. And she had no damage, no brain damage. And uh, so, uh, uh, you know, if you're, you're saying, well, okay, uh, maybe is, is, was the mother part of a, a charismatic church where they believe there's a miracle every 10 minutes? No, this is part of a mainline Protestant church. You say, well, if they had no doctors around, how do you know that she was really dead? Well, this is Africa. They see death a lot more than we do. They know what death looks like. And uh, the timing of it is, how come she began to breathe again just when they prayed and cried out to God? So what do you think? Is this a tall tale? Or an intervention by God? So I'd like you to turn to 2 Kings chapter 6. If you want to use the Bibles under our seats, it's on page 368. Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God, this is Elisha, sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. Uh, in, in a war with Israel, the Syrians were constantly attacking. And the king was saying, okay, we're going to attack from this place. But Elisha would tell the king of Israel and they, he would uh, uh, have forces go there and they would repel them time after time. This enraged the king of Aram. He, suffered, he summoned his officers and demanded of them, will you not tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord the king, said one of his officers, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. It, it enraged the king of Aram that every time he was going to attack, it was repelled, and so he said, which one of you is, is uh, leaking this information? They say, none of us. It's Elisha the prophet. God gives him the ability to know what you speak in our situation room. Angered that Elisha was eavesdropping on his plans, he uh, sent out some troops to capture uh, Elisha. Go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back. He is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around. Gehazi was afraid. When he came out in the morning and there are Assyrian troops all around them. And so Elisha prayed that God would give him the ability to see, as Elisha could, God's forces that were around as well. So if we're going to open our eyes to God's supernatural forces, we also need to be aware of the evil uh, unseen spiritual forces. The Apostle Paul says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul says there are unseen evil spiritual forces battling against us to make us ineffective, to keep us from bringing uh, people to Jesus. Uh, the evil in the world today is so dark. 
it can't simply be attributed to human sources. I mean, the terrorist attack on 9-11, ISIS taking videos of cutting off civilians' heads and posting it online, a young man shooting first graders at Sandy Hook Elementary School, a co-ed slaughtering college students at Virginia Tech, a man shooting up a nightclub in Orlando, a regime using chemical weapons on children? Come on, who does that? Now, the assailants in all these cases can't be interviewed because they're all dead. But if we could interview them, I'll bet we would find there was demonic influence whispering in their ear, do it. We need to be aware of Satan and his forces, but we're not to be afraid of them. God's forces are greater John, the apostle, writes, the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. When Mao Zedong took over China in 1949, he drove out all the uh, Christian missionaries and forced the church underground. There were many reports that year of communist forces coming to churches and finding soldiers dressed in white around the churches protecting them, and they fled And many of those uh, Chinese communists became uh, believers in Christ. God is still in the miracle business. Open our eyes to see it. Second, open our eyes to the possibility that if God does supernatural miracles today, we can believe he did them in ancient times as well. Some people scoff at the miracles in the Bible as make-believe stories of unenlightened people. They would scoff at these miracles of Elisha that we're looking at, or the miracles of Jesus in the Gospels. It's not necessary to dismiss these as legendary, fanciful, or inaccurate, just because they report miracles. Today's world is full of first-hand accounts of miracles being done by God, by eyewitnesses. And so if They're done today. There's no reason that we can believe that God couldn't do them in ancient times as well. If today's accounts stem from eyewitnesses, then the same can be true in the Bible. So, I have a pen here. If I drop this pen, the law of gravity says it's going to fall to the floor, right? So I drop it. Whoa, you see that? I'm like David Copperfield. (laughs) Just because I intervene and grab the pen doesn't mean I stop the law of gravity. Likewise, God can intervene in this world. If we believe God exists, the God who created all this beauty, he can intervene in the world. What's so crazy about that? People who ridicule Those who believe in miracles in the Bible say that we can't believe the miracles because they can't be scientifically replicated. Well, of course not. They're one-offs. They're part of history. History can't be repeated. I mean, how could we test whether a person had been uh, dead and brought back to life? Would we shoot them and try again? Come on. Insisting that miracles have to be replicated in order to have actually taken place is to rule them out entirely. So we study biblical miracles just the way we study any other historical accounts. Be skeptical, but open. In civil law, the standard is more probable than not. That's the standard most historians apply to their work. We ask, is it more probable than not that this miracle took place? Ask questions like, were there eyewitnesses? The more eyewitnesses we have that are reliable, the more likely the miracle took place. Do the, rep- uh, do the witnesses have a reputation for being honest? Do they have anything to gain or lose? Did they have a good opportunity to observe what occurred? Do we have medical records? If we determine the accounts are historically reliable, we have no reason not to believe the miracles. If God does miracles today, he could have done them then. He did them then, and God is still in the miracle business.
Third, open our eyes to the possibility that God does supernatural miracles in small ways as well as large. This is the fifth in a series of messages, have you seen the supernatural power of God lately? This is the third time I've mentioned small miracles. I hope I'm not boring you, but I think this is important. Elisha is famous for his small miracles. Here's one in 2 Kings 6. The company of the prophets said to Elisha, look, the place where we meet with you is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan where each of us can get a pole and let us build a place for us to live. And he said, go. The seminary was growing. Remember, Elijah star started the company of the prophets and Elisha was continuing it and more and more people were wanting to become prophets like Elijah and Elisha. So they said, we need to build bigger dorms and bigger classrooms. Then one of them said, won't you please come with your servants? I will, Elisha replied, and he went with them. They went to the Jordan, that's the river, and began to cut down trees. As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. Oh, my Lord, he cried out, it was borrowed. While they were felling trees, an axe head fell off of one of the uh, guy's uh, axes, and he said, oh, no, I borrowed that from a friend. I don't have any money to replace it. I mean, there are no people poorer than seminary students. Remember I told you a couple weeks ago that when Jory and I got married, I had 72 cents in my account? The man of God asked, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it there and made the iron float up out of the Jordan River. Lift it out, he said. Then the man reached out his hand and took it. Now, as problems go, this one is not a biggie. I mean, whether or not this guy gets his axe head back is not going to matter for national affairs in Israel. If you ever need a case that God cares about small things in your life, this is it. Jesus said, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. So don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. If God cares about birds then he cares about you. I'm not very mechanically inclined. One day uh, I was trying to fix one of the cabinets in our kitchen. The hardware had broken. So I managed to take the hardware off and then I realized I didn't have the replacement for it. So I went to the store and I got the replacement. I came back and I realized that this one wasn't like the one I'd taken off. I'd got the wrong kind. So I had to go back to store a second time. So then, uh, you know, I'm working on it. It was easy enough taking it off, but putting it back on, I, I couldn't figure out how it worked. So I was getting pretty frustrated, and uh, finally I got it on. But the door wouldn't shut. I mean, at that point, I began to go ballistic. I mean, it had already taken longer than I had allotted, and uh, when I was done, it looked worse than when I started. So at that point, I prayed. I said, God, you know I'm not very good at this stuff. Uh, help me figure out how to put this on, and help me not get mad. Well, God answered that prayer. I didn't get angry, and I actually was able to get it on correctly, and guess what? The door actually shut. You say, well, I'm not sure I'd call that a miracle. Well, if you knew how bad I am at mechanical things, you'd put this one in the miracle column. <laughs> a couple weeks ago, uh, Jim and Ann Story were going out of church, and they told me of a small miracle in their lives. A lot of you have been telling me stories these last five weeks, and they said they were uh, uh, skiing in um, Lake Billy Chinook, and they lost their boat key and went to the bottom of the lake. They didn't have a flotation device on it. A boat is not any good without a key. So what were they going to do? So they prayed, God. And just then, a scuba diver came down the dock. And yeah, and he, he jumped in, went down. Three minutes later, he brought up their boat key. They said they have never seen a scuba diver before or since then at Billy Chinook. They call that a miracle. Lee Strobel, in his book, The Case for Miracles, and uh, if you know much about Lee Strobel, he only puts in his books cases that can be corroborated by good eyewitnesses. Tells about equatorial Africa. A woman gave birth to a daughter, and the woman died in childbirth. 
leaving this little beautiful infant and a two-year-old sister. So they're trying to take care of this little girl and they found a hot water bottle and uh, they were using that to keep her warm and uh, but the water bottle broke and it was the only one in the town. So what are they going to do? They're worried about as the temperatures went down at night. Some people are surprised, but on the equator, you know, the sun goes up, it comes up at six, it goes down at six, and so it actually gets cool at night. In, in um, at Kenya, where our sun works, you know, it gets down to 60 maybe, or 55 at night. And uh, so they're worried about this little girl, and uh, so the, uh, the uh, missionary physician uh, called together the orphans, and uh, she said, let's pray for this little baby. And one girl, a girl named Ruth, uh, took it too far. She said, God, please give us another hot water bottle today. It won't do any good tomorrow. The baby might freeze. And while you're at it, would you put in a little dolly for the, her sister so she'll know that you care about her too? Well, the missionary doctor is thinking, how can I say amen to that prayer? That's an impossible the only way that could be answered would be a parcel coming and she'd worked there four years and never received a single one. Well, that afternoon, a 22-pound parcel arrived and the orphans were going through it and uh, the missionary reached down and she couldn't believe it. Here was a hot water bottle. And when Ruth heard that, the little 10-year-old, she said, well, then there must be a doll in there too. And she's reaching down in there, and sure enough, at the bottom of the box is a little doll for the sister. Happen chance that this arrives the day the girl prays? This was packed by the missionary's home church in Ireland months earlier. And the gal who packed it, she said, you know, I just had a prompting from the Holy Spirit that I should put in a hot water bottle. And it was a little girl that put in the doll. God is still in the miracle business. You may think it's silly to bother the creator with problems about cabinets or keys or hot water bottles. But I found God wants to be involved in all parts of our lives. We're supposed to pray to him about everything, the Apostle Paul says. If you want to see more miracles in your life, begin to pray about the small stuff. Fourth, open our eyes to the possibility of God using supernatural miracles to lead people to Christ. Often God uses his power to draw people to faith. This was the case in a, another miracle Elisha performed. This is 2 Kings 6.18. As the enemy came down toward him, this is uh, the enemies from Syria trying to capture Elisha. They're angry that he's, you know, telling the king what their plans were. Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike these people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness, as Elisha had asked. Elisha told them, this is not the road, this is not the city, follow me. And I will lead you to the man you're looking for. And he led them to Samaria. Samaria is the capital of Israel. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and there they were inside Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? Do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill men you have captured with your own sword? Set food and water before them so they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them, and after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away, and they returned to their master. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. So Elisha prayed for God to blind them, and then he led them into Samaria, the capital of Israel. And the king said, should I put them to death? He said, no, that would void the whole purpose of the miracle, that they might learn that there is true, Israel, uh, true prophet in Israel of the one true God. So they might come to faith. Furthermore, putting them to death is like an act of war. And that's not going to lead to peace. And so the passage ends. So the bands of Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. 
Many of the miracles we read about today occur in third world countries where there's high illiteracy. How are they going to read about God, about Christ? And there's little or no medical care. How else are they going to get well? And the spirit world is very real to them. It's out in the open, good versus evil. Angels versus demons. And so spiritual, supernatural power is a demonstration of God's power. I read uh, a couple weeks ago that 90% of the conversions in rural China are fueled by miracles of healing. But God does miracles in the States as well. Ed Wilkinson, who is educated as a neuropsychologist, son, uh, he, uh, Ed's uh, belief is that Christians that believe in miracles are just kind of in a, in a neurosis so they don't have to deal with reality. His son had, uh, was diagnosed with two holes in his heart and uh, it was affecting his lungs as well and so he was scheduled for surgery. As uh, surgery uh, drew near, um, he, was, uh, he was eight years old, his name was Brad, and he was giving away his toys, believing that he probably wasn't going to survive. And so he asked his dad, am I going to die? His dad said, well, I mean, yeah, this surgery is very serious, but probably you won't die. And he said, can Jesus heal me? Well, Ed's belief was, you know, he didn't believe in healing and supernatural power of God. And he says, well, let me get back to you on that one. So he got a Bible and he began reading it and studying it and praying. And he came back to his son and he said, you know what? Jesus is real. And miracles can happen. I don't know if it's going to happen for you. And a minister came to visit them uh, just before his surgery, and he said to little Brad, do you believe Jesus can heal you? He said, yes. And so he prayed. So they took an MRI the day before, and it showed the two hole, holes in his heart and the blood seeping out, and uh, uh, he went in for surgery. It was to be four hours long. About an hour into the surgery, the surgeon invited Ed in and he said, look at these two MRIs. This is the one yesterday showing the holes in his heart. And here's the one today. A, a wall has been built up. His heart is fine now. He doesn't need surgery. He said, I don't know how to explain this any other way, but Ed, you got a miracle. So there we go again. God does supernatural miracles today. This is a highly educated neuropsychologist who has come to believe God does miracles. Whether it's a big thing like being healed, receiving a supernatural dream from God, having an angel protect us, or a small thing like household projects, God performs miracle so that we might tell that story and bring glory to him. When we tell people miracles that have happened in our lives, this might draw them to Christ and attract them that there really is a God. There are hundreds and hundreds of stories today of miracles God has performed in our day. They give us confidence that the miracles recorded in the Bible can also be true. Some of the miracles are big. Some of the miracles are little. But they all help us realize that God is still in the miracle business. And why not? God is supernatural. If we come into a relationship with God through Christ, we will experience the supernatural as well. Lord Jesus, thank you for these stories in your word about Elisha and the miracles that you did through him. We thank you for them, that we can believe the miracles in the Bible because there are reliable witnesses and we see the miracles today in our lives or in stories we read of others, amazing things that you have done. Many people have uh, shared with me stories, God, of miracles that they've seen in their lives as I've uh, shared this series, uh, but 
we'd like to see more. We'd like to see more uh, things happen in our lives. We need miracles. I'd like you to pray with me right now for a miracle in your life. If you've got something going on in your life where you say, I need a miracle, would you just like hold it in your hand and lift up your hand for a moment and I'm going to pray? You say, God, I need a miracle of healing. Or God, I've got a problem I don't know how to solve. Just lift up your hand, lift it up to God. God's the, your only hope. So I want to pray for all of you. Lord God, we thank you for all these people lifting up their hands, signifying that they've got something they don't know how to deal with. They need a miracle from you. And so we pray for that today. Just as you did miracles in ancient times recorded in the Bible, we believe you do them today. We've got all kinds of accounts. And so we pray for a miracle right now. Whatever is being held up in a hand, we lift it to you and ask for your supernatural power. And many others haven't raised their hand, Lord, but they need a miracle too. And we pray. So I pray for everyone here today. In Jesus' name we pray.